very good afternoon to all of you we from star health insurance always wish that whatever we do we want to do with a clarity and perfection today there are close to two crore customers who have enforced confidence in us and who have taken a policy from star health insurance so it is our duty to do the best of services without any compromise to all our customers and we as we all know there is a pandemic and uh, we have 300 plus doctors who are working for us processing close to 4000-5000 claims in a day and naturally we should have a thorough knowledge of what is happening, what is the right treatment relating to pandemic, what are those conditions which are confirmed, which are suspected and how to really identify the real need for admission and the right treatment that should be given to our customers. So we cannot, obviously we cannot do these things by ourselves, we need to take the help of experts. So we have with us now our experts, the subject experts who are specialists in this field and who have decades of experience in this area and who have been treating these patients day in and day out. I am very glad and thankful and at the outset I want to submit my respect to all our uh, panelists joined us for this uh, uh, fireside chat. And along with me I have Dr. Krishna, our senior physician who is going to ask a question to our expert panelist. Let me introduce the panelists. We have Professor Balasubramaniam on my left. He is a head of department of pediatrics from Ramachandra Medical College and director at Kanji Kamakodi Hospital for Children. A very, very passionate pediatrician and he is a teacher of teachers. I am very glad there, sir, for joining us Thank for you. this uh, fireside chat. I have Dr. Uh, Ramasubramaniam who is well known as an infectious disease consultant and a doctor in charge of adult vaccination in this country. So most of us are uh, well known uh, to Professor Ram Subramaniam and Dr. Ram Subramaniam is part of our star extended family in the way that you know he takes a lot of interest to teach our doctors on the management of infectious diseases. So I am thankful to you Dr. Ram Subramaniam for your time and we have our Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Bala Subramaniam, a very senior infectious disease consultant who works in corporate hospitals in Chennai. And she has a uh, graduation and post-graduation from India and overseas. Very eminent doctor, very, very service-oriented doctor. And uh, very many times we disturb her to know about the basics and to understand whether what we are doing is right. So that we always want to be, every one of the doctors who are viewing this seminar, I want you to be very clear that whatever we do, we should do with 100% clarity. There should be no compromise. You do whatever you know after hearing this seminar. If you do not know, please stop and take help from your senior colleagues. So with this, I am very thankful to the panelists again for joining us. I would request Dr. Krishna to go ahead with the questions. Thank you, sir. Sir, it is a privilege to welcome all of you to this discussion. So we have few questions, sir, which we seek your valuable advice. So first we have gone through the first wave and we are almost at the end of the second wave now. So can you describe your experience in both the waves, sir? What was the major difference between the first and second wave? And what were the major challenges in the second wave? Yes, uh, we have seen two waves now and uh, we may be looking at another wave in the near future. Having said that, the disease has remained reasonably similar in both waves, except for a few changes which we have seen. We learnt during the first wave that the disease predominantly causes complications and you know poor outcomes in elderly people or people with comorbidities and that is how the first wave truly behaved. But during the second wave we started seeing younger people, people who had no comorbidities, reasonably fit people in their 30s who unfortunately had worse outcomes. Not all of them but Compared to the first wave, the outcomes in younger people without comorbidities were seen much more. The reason for which is not clear. Is it the ability of the mutant to cause this kind of a virulent uh, infection? We don't know. The second thing is that the transmissibility was also much higher. During the first wave, if we found that in a family of six, after the index patient, one or two people got the infection, we found in the second wave almost the entire family came down with the infection when one of the members got it. We also noted certain different, mildly different symptoms during the second wave. People had more of uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. People sometimes had conjunctivitis which was more marked. 
We also noticed a lot of the people after recovery from COVID continued to have a low grade fever. We knew that the fever could last up to 14 days during the first wave. But in the second wave, after the 14th day, some of them got better, but continued to have fever, sometimes intermittent fever for another week or 10 days more. This was a little odd because we had to investigate to see whether there was anything else. We couldn't find anything else. So there were some differences and we really learnt that even though COVID or SARS coronavirus is a respiratory virus, it had features involving several systems in the body. So those were the changes. Madam, we have seen many new variants of SARS-CoV-2 being identified now. Is there any clinical significance for each of the same regarding the presentation, course in the hospitals, complications, age group or treatment? Whenever you have a variant coming up, which is becoming very prominent, there are two things which are more important. One is the infectiousness, next is the virulence. So the second wave with the Delta variant started because the infectiousness was very high. We still don't know whether the virulence is higher than the previous thing, we are not sure. The sheer numbers, the number system is probably five to six times more than the first wave. So obviously a small proportion of youngsters were also becoming sick. We saw everything we saw in the previous wave but within a larger numbers. So what we clearly know is whenever there is a change in infectiousness or change in virulence, you will have patients either coming in sick or coming in larger numbers. So as the change goes on, though they are talking about a new variant Delta Plus, my assumption if it is going to be a minor variant, you may not see much. If it is a major variant, there should be a bigger wave. Again, if it is a major variant, it will take a longer time to get established. So if it is a major variant, we might see a gap and then a peak after that. If it is a minor variant, some recruiters in pockets here and there and then going down. So what we get to understand is we have to live with it. We have to constantly see, see, keep seeing the variants. We have to evaluate that because this genomic streaming is something which we are not doing constantly. So even this wave, all of us had seen pockets where families became sick and families, everybody came and nobody became sick. You will have an entire family becoming sick, at least 60, 70 percent dying in that family. And there will be another family when all of them coming in, come, developing the infection, nobody will be sick. This could just be because the virus, by this particular, particular family where they died. The mutant, they could have been a mutant, but we don't do the streaming. So everybody is talking about Delta Plus. They say it started from Bangladesh, Nepal, but then it must have been in India from the long time. It's just that it don't seems to come out. Similarly, Delta variant, the name and everything came out much later. When the wave started, we weren't sure whether it's the same Wuhan virus or something else. We didn't know that infectious is more. As the time went on, we realized this is something which we probably need to know earlier to put the support to measures and establish the infrastructure in a better way. Madam, in this context, between virulence and infectiousness, is, there, is it inversely related? We saw some of the pandemics where the virulence is very high. Yes. Mortality rate was also higher, but the pandemic, uh, fortunately, you know. Generally, it's supposed to be inverse related. But now we know a lot of things are also related to human behavior. In the Ebola epidemic, we realized that, see, the idea is if it's a very virulent organism, the host gets killed. So obviously the infection gets mitigated. So it will go like this and just stop like that. But then human behavior is something which we don't calculate. So let's say virulent strain goes, people go underground. If it keeps on spreading underground, obviously it's not going to go up and get, even now we are talking about the wave going up fast and coming down fast. It could be because we had herd immunity. It could also be because a sizable population went into house. They were not there to get the infection. That could also be the reason where it came down fast. So, along with virulence and infectiousness, I am adding one more point of human behavior which decides everything. So, hereafter it will not be directly correlated. It will not be inversely proportional. We can assume, but it won't be. That is a very valid point. So, human behavior has got a very, very powerful role here. Definitely. In this context, is the Delta plus variant then a variant of concern? Do you think that will spike the third wave? Better? Well, it's too early. See, like you've just had a wave coming down. Um, let's think logically. See, you have got a big epidemic, you know, a sizable proportion of population got infected. There will be variants emerging. So, for some variant to establish and become a big epidemic, it needs time to change so much. Let's say if alters slightly, there will be some amount of immune tolerance. It cannot be totally different immunity. So, obviously, there will be recrudescence. But then again, the recrudescence could be because of delta, could be because of delta plus, it could be delta minus, it could be few strains. But 
another totally different strain coming immediately in a country this huge from outside slightly unlikely but then you know what happened in UK 2 and 2 is followed by 2.2 but then there were two different strains not something with a slight variation. So, if we have a totally different strain come in with a naive population not vaccinated with everybody going out 10 IS you will have a bigger 2.2 otherwise the 2.2 will be a small recrudescence and settle down and that is what we are all hoping for. Bala Subramanian sir, what was your experience of pediatric involvement sir in the first wave and second wave and what do you think would be the level of pediatric involvement in the third wave sir? Will the third wave hit children more as speculated? Basically pediatric COVID has not been a great challenge for pediatricians so far. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, for some reasons uh, not clearly understood by scientists, this if infectious disease for a change is not hitting children hard, but is hitting the parents and grandparents very hard. That is because, you know, the ACE2 receptors are probably not well developed in children. That is one of the hypotheses. And now we all know that uh, pediatric COVID is by and large a mild illness. That is what we have seen in India also. But if you look at the figures in the first wave and second wave, in the first wave but it was around 8 percent of all the infections uh, which occurred in children. In the second wave it went up to 12 to 15 percent. And even amongst those 15 percent infected, we had to hospitalize hardly about 2 to 3 percent of them. So, our uh, uh, numbers are very small. But unfortunately, a new disease has come. It is not COVID which is worrying us in pediatrics. Unlike uh, adults who, who require oxygen, who require oxygenators, who require ventilatory support, less than 0.5 percent of children who get infected go into the ICU and require oxygen. And if, if they go into the ICU, they either die or they recover. But uh, there had been very little of uh, deaths in pediatric COVID internationally and also in India, that is one. But unfortunately, a new disease has emerged out of uh, COVID. It is not COVID, it is a problem. It is what is called MIS-C, it is called multi-system inflammatory syndrome secondary to SARS-CoV-2 infection. What happens is that uh, most children who recover from COVID with mild symptoms or without symptoms, they develop antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 viruses. And uh, due to the development of antibodies, they develop uh, a situation very similar to cytokine storm which occurs in adults with severe COVID. After a latent period of around uh, 2 to 8 weeks and this disease has been labeled as MIS-C and this, is, this disease funnily resembles an earlier disease called Kawasaki disease. All of us know about Kawasaki motorcycle. <laughs> This Kawasaki disease which was first described in Japan is a disease which is very, very peculiar. It is, uh, it behaves like uh, measles or a viral exanthematous illness with red eyes, red tongue, rash and it can involve the heart and sometimes neck nodes may be there, child may be ill. The same presentation had occurred in this MIS-C and this is where a lot of deaths have been seen all over the world. And this disease unfortunately was not recognized in the early stages. Everybody would think it is only infection. In India we are always obsessed with infections. We give antibiotics and this antibiotic won't do anything for this MIS-C. This MIS-C requires treatment with uh, uh, an expensive medication. All of us know the intravenous immunoglobulin and high dose steroid which we are normally very scared to give when we think of infection in pediatrics. And uh, quite a few of these children develop cardiac complications, they can die. That is a problem in pediatrics. But by and large, SARS CoV 2 has been very kind to children, but unkind to pediatricians. Can we predict when, see, when, when you are talking about missing, all parents are anxious, they are apprehensive. So, when there is a fever and when it extends for 5 days, 6 days, how can we predict that this child may go in for a missy? Is there any way we can caution the family and ask them to take any, caution, uh, any uh, precautions? That is a very, very pertinent question. Uh, Missy, like the 
uh, Kawasaki disease is essentially a clinical diagnosis. Nowadays, you know, the pa parents, whenever you make a diagnosis of a disease, they want like uh, the Pakistan is proof or evidence. They want a CT, they want a lab number and they want a report which is positive or negative. That's what they expect. Unfortunately, if the diagnosis of MISSI is essentially a clinical diagnosis and it's a diagnosis of exclusion because it resembles measles, it resembles toxic shock syndrome, a very serious disease, it resembles Kawasaki, it resembles several hematological disorders like macrophage activation syndrome. And in the first few days of illness, even the best of clinicians, for example, you have an upper respiratory infection. An upper respiratory infection can be due to SARS-CoV-2, can be due to adenovirus, can be due to rhino, any virus. No clinician, however experienced like uh, Dr. <laughs> Ramsuranev is, is impossible to say this is caused by SARS-CoV-2. Similarly, in the first few days of illness, it is very difficult to pinpoint a diagnosis of MISC. However, fortunately, we have good clinical clues. Relentless fever, which is not coming down, probably day three, day four. Yes, in this epidemiological situation, you start suspecting it could be Missy. One, two, if a child has got some warning signs, which we normally counsel for every disease in children, for that matter, even in adults, particularly in children, if they have red eyes without any discharge, usually when you have conjunctivitis, there is some discharge. Here the outer portion, the bulbar conjunctiva becomes red without any discharge. The lower portion of the eyes, the, the palpable conjunctiva is, is quite white. Second is the tongue becomes red. The lips develop chelitis. Some of them may have lymphadenopathy in the neck or elsewhere. They may have a rash. More importantly, these children, unlike adults with SARS-CoV-2 infection, they rarely have respiratory manifestation. They confuse the primary doctor with vague symptoms such as to have appendicitis, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea. More importantly, these children are quite ill. Even the moment they enter your chamber, you know this child is ill. And in addition to that, the laboratory clues are quite important. The C-reactive protein, which is one of the prognostic markers for severe COVID in adults, it goes up sky high in this MISI. So basically, one has to suspect and it behaves differently from the SARS-CoV-2 severe COVID. And it's a holistic clinical diagnosis of exclusion and not on labs alone. Sir, during this pandemic, we have seen mild and asymptomatic patients getting panicked and going to the hospital and getting admitted. Should we encourage this? See, unfortunately, because of the uncertainty involved with COVID per se and the increased uncertainty seen during the second wave when we found that younger people who in the first wave was, you know, they were very safe to stay at home. These people staying at home suddenly deteriorated in a matter of two or three days and required oxygen in the hospital. There was a panic amongst the patients and this extended to doctors also. So when the patients started asking, you know, you say he is all right for home isolation, but the same thing happened to my cousin and he had to be hospitalized three days later and he became very sick. Can we admit, admit him in the hospital right now? And it is very difficult for a clinician to say, no, 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 I guarantee you that that will not happen. You keep him at home. So this kind of uh, paranoia started amongst patients and spread to the doctors. And these are, you know, in, in India, the predominant uh, healthcare delivery is private. And these are people who could afford to pay for their care. And when they insisted that they get admitted and treatment started immediately, even though we know very clearly that medical evidence says the only treatment for COVID is after they have become hypoxic, whether you give steroids, whether you give, uh, you know, other immunomodulators, they all are indicated only when the patient becomes hypoxic, except the recent arrival of the monoclonal antibody cocktail, which has to be given to prevent complications. Till recently, the only treatment was oxygen, steroids and immunomodulators. And all of them should be given after hospitalization when they are hypoxic. But because of this fear, people started becoming ir irrational, the doctors also started behaving, un un unfortunately, a little, you know, non-evidence-based when they started 
initiating treatment even early in patients who did not warrant treatment and patients were forced to be admitted. So that is the reason why the second wave caused a lot of fatalities because a lot of people died before they could access care even in an early stage when they were minimally hypoxic. See here, the only concern for us is if people are getting admitted out of anxiety and fear, then it may not allow a deserving patient to get his, his bed or her bed. You should have several separate stages. You should have a quarantine center, a hospital. So you should categorize because our government per se didn't want everybody to be at home. They wanted all category B1 to be admitted. So when a patient says, so most of the hospital, I guess even Apollo had it, no? quarantine center and hospital. So we divided into quarantine center and hospital. So majority of them were in quarantine center. The trouble started when some of them in quarantine center were not comfortable and they wanted to come to the hospital. That's the crowd which could have been easily avoided, but that's becoming very difficult, as I said, during the peak of the epidemic. When a family member gets sick or dies, it becomes really difficult. See, it is very easy to treat somebody's physical ailments. When they say they are breathing, uh, having difficulty in breathing, you check the saturation is 92%. It's easy. You, you know what is happening, you start treatment. But when a person is afraid, when a person panics, the patient person insists that, no, I need to be in a hospital. I can't stay in a hotel or institutional quarantine. Put me in a hospital. And, you know, he's, you, in India, you know, people start using influence. People start contacting people, politics. And they come and occupy hospital beds, which they don't need to. And they come and occupy hospital beds, which they don't need to. And as you said, the patients who deserve, in the meanwhile, are going around searching for hospitals. And they come to a hospital very late. And it is too late for anything to be done. So what I learned from your views, if there is going to be a third wave, we should look at a proper triage and quarantine facilities. And there should be one pre-hospital to care for these people. So and the triage can exactly identify those who require immediate hospitalization and those who can be treated at home. Also, these home patients were isolated at home. We really didn't have resources or, you know, uh, amenities including software to follow them I'm at home. So all the hospitals have come out with systems to follow them just now. It didn't happen in the first wave. Towards the end, tail end of the second one wave only they started it off. So that also matters. If a patient knows that there is somebody to look after me from home, somebody who can talk to me, who can put me in the hospital, they'll stay at home. That also didn't happen early in the second wave. Only after the peak, every hospital started doing it. So what we should be equipped with is a triage and telemedicine system. So that like, you know, we can triage if they can, uh, if they don't require admission at that point of time in your assessment, you can make them stay at home. But as you rightly said, there can be a telemedicine services which can constantly monitor yes. these patients. I would add two more things to this. One, I think you need a lot of these uh, quarantine centers were manned by nurses or, you know, non-doctoral people manned them. So that made people very uncomfortable to stay there. You know, if you have a nurse going in and checking once a day and tell you it is all right, they insisted that they needed a doctor to be taking care of them. The other thing is you need a template, a system of guideline which everybody needs to follow on a standard basis. We found that, as I said, people were initiated on steroids even when they did not need it. People were given high dose of immunomodulators. In fact, I know one of the hospitals which state gave steroids based on the severity. So if you had an oxygen saturation of 95%, you got 8 milligrams of dexamethasone. If you had an oxygen of around 90, they gave you, you know, methylprednisolone, uh, 40 milligrams three times a day. If the person came in with a saturation of less than 90, they were given solumedrol 1 gram. There is absolutely no rationale in this. But the anxiety, the worry, the fear, you know, because the patients were also very, very uh, belligerent sometimes. So all these cost chaos. So you need to have a standard system which is evidence based, which can be part, which can be, you know, spread or disseminated all around. And Tamil Nadu government bought that, brought that in. But that also was a little late during the game. But at least they started, and after that became, it, things became a little better. So lack of proper template and the irrational use of drugs. So equal to triage and telemedicine, we should also do some training to prevent this. I think the triage, telemedicine and training should be the message for the policy makers. If you have to prepare really for the third wave. And training is like, you know, sessions like this where people have to attend and understand. See, a virus can do a damage to a patient, but not my treatment. And every doctor here should know that we are not here to cause further harm. And this is the first time where 
patients dictated to doctors what the treatment should be. You know, there's so much of information available from, for everybody from all over the world that they started asking you, have you given tocilizumab? Have you started on baricitinib? No, in my colleague in the US says that this is a situation where you should start. And you know, a doctor gets unnerved when, when you start questioning him and giving him facts from, you know, people from around the world. It's very difficult to hold your own unless you have experience and uh, expertise. As a pediatrician, I have faced uh, uh, many times uh, parents whose children are uh, PCR positive, uh, who are either well or mildly symptomatic, me prescribing only paracetamol and doing telecounseling, reassuring them, and the parents showing me prescriptions of the parents and the grandparents containing 10 drugs and asking me why you are not giving anything. I will tell you that there is a very uh, peculiar reason. Unlike pediatricians who have been dealing with infectious diseases, URA, LRA, gastroenteritis, day in and day out, unfortunately, the general physicians and adult physicians have never been challenged with a viral infection ever in the history. I wish this, if this had happened in pediatrics, we would have handled it probably with less drugs. I'm honest in telling you. I have to less reluctantly drugs. say yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. We would have probably handled it with less drugs. The no, no, I'm, I'm not blaming the physicians. So they then never half of them go to adult physicians. There yes. are GPs who handle everything. Yes. In fact, uh, many of my children who have been given prescriptions by physicians, 10 drugs, I've stopped all of them except paracetamol. So I think it's a question. See, it doesn't happen in the UK where there is a good system, there is good triaging. Here, the WhatsApp university thesis have been responsible for all this sort of polypharmacy. But they go and take medicine. We started with chloroquine, then we started steroid, then we started ivermectin, now glucose, something a monoclonal antibody will come. I think we must have a clear cut protocol. And it requires courage for a doctor to say that at this point of time, except paracetamol, nothing is going to work. And at a given point, I mean, steroids are life saving, but you must know when to time it. Tosulisima may save life, but you must know when to time it. It's like uh, one day cricket. You must know how to play an individual ball. That is what people like Ram Subramaniam can do well. Unfortunately, such protocols have not percolated down to the periphery. That's a reality. I think he said it very correctly. The doctor should walk the talk in sense of sticking to the guns and saying, you know, in this situation, you don't require anything more than paracetamol. That's very difficult for doctors. As you rightly said, sir, it was more of a panic rather than the necessity. But uh, our central government, just like uh, our Tamil Nadu government, has clearly defined the protocols via AIMS and ICMR, periodically comes with guidelines. So can we take this as a standard treatment protocol, sir? Because if you see every fortnightly, the government updates, standard treatment protocols are published. And these are circulated pan India. Can we take this as a standard treatment protocol, whether it is home isolation or admission? Can we take this as a gold standard? Yes, I think you can take it, but I would add a little caveat to this. One, all this, as we discussed earlier, whether it was the Indian government or the Tamil Nadu government, unfortunately, the process started a little late during the course. What we should have defined this during the first wave. And by the time we had the second wave, we should have put this in place. But people were not expecting a second wave. Most people said that we will not get a second wave. So the second wave caught everybody off guard. So that was the reason why this happened. The second thing when I said about caveat, we find that unfortunately, even some of the central government guidelines have issues which are not evidence based. I think Dr. Vijayalakshmi would agree with me that there are certain points in which, which all of us feel are not correct, whether it is chloroquine, whether it is ivermectin, there are still lacunae with regard to the evidence, strength of evidence in these situations and we probably need to be a little more refined in those areas. Sir, why was the mortality higher in the younger age groups and also in patients with no comorbids? As you said... Uh, oh, you are talking about adults? Yes. This we wave had this peculiarity where young patients and patients with no comorbids, 
we saw them fall prey to the disease. As Dr. Vijayalakshmi said, the second wave was predominantly caused by the Delta virus. Almost 70% of cases by the end of May were because of Delta. And we still haven't clearly deciphered the, the specific properties. We know it is more transmissible. We know it is more infectious. We probably think it is also has the ability to cause more severe illness even without comorbidities. So this is speculation. But I think with a little more time, we should be able, if this, once this Delta virus starts hitting the rest, now UK is coming with the third wave, the Delta virus is going to start spreading. We'll probably have, you know, uh, definite proof of what we are just speculating. Madam, what is the current trend of mucormycosis? In the first wave, we did not see much of mucormycosis compared to the second wave. We did see mucormycosis after the first wave too, but uh, we had it's assumed more pronounced it. Now. This time we are seeing it more. But at the time we assumed it was because of uncontrolled diabetes. Because one thing that happened during this is there was a diabetes epidemic literally. Nobody went to the doctors. People were eating rampantly. Nobody monitored their sugars. So sugars went out of control. Like I would say as a single person, last wave if I had seen one case, now I am seeing 10 cases. So numbers became really huge this time. And uh, I guess it's something to do with this Delta virus strain per se because we are seeing in patients who have not been on steroids, had a milder infection, some with severe infection, some non-diabetics also. So it is probably not a single factor, something to do with this infection. Probably along with it, if they are a diabetic, if they have CKD, if they have had steroids, if they have a prolonged stay in the hospital, the chance becomes higher. So even if you see, we are using steroids in other medical conditions like yes. rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, lots of connective tissue disorder, but we are not seeing mucor in those. But uh, why have, is it so peculiar? I have seen patients who have not had steroids coming with mucor too. Now I just, one patient has gone for a surgery today. This patient had come in with a CKD patient, came with, was admitted in another hospital, then like fought and came over here, had received 40 mg of solimetal, was on 15 liters, we just put him on dexamethasone 8 mg came down after dialysis, 6th day made it to 4th m 4 mg, 8th day had eighth day some eye pain, stopped completely, only 8 days of this is a steroid he received, had mucor, that's it, no steroid exposure before that, oxygen, yes, he was on oxygen for the whole 8 days, but nothing else, had mucor, sugars were not very bad, HbA1c of 7.2, so we do see patients who have not been on much steroids, who have not been having uncontrolled sugars, also coming with mucor, but predominantly, majority of patients have been, uh, have been having uncontrolled sugars with a significant use of steroids. Somehow, COVID per se predisposes to it, especially if they have diabetes, if they have steroid use, it seems to increase the risk. So, so the mucor is due to the immunosuppression created by COVID more than the <coughs> drugs Also, well. probably there could be something to do with its immunomodulatory <coughs> function because some amount of, because this seems to be predominantly ROCM. Because whatever we saw, some lung and lung pneumonias we see, predominantly orbital, rhino orbital uh, mucos, some pneumonias, if I see, let us say 10, one pneumonia comes in. If it is going to be disseminated mucor, abdominal mucor, there are patients with other risk factors. <coughs> and again, uh, frankly speaking, the last 15 years I have been an ID physician, it is like uh, probably one or two disseminated mucos had survived. This time, and this time amazingly disseminated mucos are surviving which is something which is new for us because the dictum used to be disseminated mucor is used to be de death sentence. So I would say 15 years I have had two patients who survived literally. This time we have had four or five patients surviving with disseminated mucor. So that is also different. The way they present and some of them even on treatment keep on progressing. So it seems to be different. We still do not understand the system completely. But yes, mucor is the surgical debridement with antifungal does work and stopping steroids helps. Early surgical debridement definitely helps. Be it AMFO or POSA, both seems to work. So medicines have to go, surgical debridement and more majority of lung involvement, some of them like when they are very sick, we do not go for debridement, they still survive. Sir, what was your experience of mucor in pediatrics? Do, do, have you seen any mucor in pediatrics? Fortunately, I have not seen a single case in our hospital also, you have not seen uh, any. Throughout India, I can uh, give figures, there are hardly any, only only few cases have been anecdotally quoted. It is not going to be, see, we have been using steroids, like she said, uh, left and right, 
And since pediatric COVID itself is mild in most children, I don't think mucormycosis is going to be a problem. You're going to be missy and missy and not severe COVID. That's going to be our headache. Missy is going to, in fact, I, I was just thinking when she was saying about the Delta Plus variant, he, you must all philosophically remember this world belongs to microbes. They were there before human beings were created. We have occupied their territory and they have a right to live and they are asserting it. See the virus, the moment you give vaccine and the virus doesn't have takers in the community, the virus is intelligent enough to change its color, mutate. It's going to constantly mutate. If anybody says it's going to go off in one year, I don't think it's going to happen. It's going to be with us for quite some time. It is now finding new subjects with mutations. It's now trying to attack younger people. It's trying to live longer in the society. I don't think it is going to go off. It's, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very pessimistic about the long-term persistence of this virus in the community. This may go the flu way where me and Ram Suranyam will be taking and giving shots every year to the people. In your view, the origin of this virus? <laughs> Uh, that's a very difficult question. I'm not a scientist, but the way the virus is behaving, I mean, it is defying all uh, rules in virology and all the tenets and basics of virology. I'm sure Ram will agree. You know, it's puzzling virologists, puzzling ID pundits, mm. it's puzzling poor clinicians like me. So it looks like something which has been created with somebody putting a lot of work behind it. That's all I know. Regarding post-COVID sequelae or long COVID syndrome, we are seeing now often there are even clinics which are opened to treat post-COVID syndromes. What are the situations where they may require hospitalizations and how to manage these? See, most of post-COVID symptoms are in general not very serious illnesses but very, very disturbing illnesses. This may be tiredness, lack of energy, uh, you know, minimal breathing difficulty on exertion, joint pains, tightness in the chest, dryness in the mouth, persistent cough which may come in spasms, loss of hair. I've had people who have had severe hair loss after recovering from COVID and neuropsychological conditions, difficulty to concentrate, uh, panic attacks and cardiac issues which could be palpitations and sometimes arrhythmias. Most of them are outpatient, uh, need outpatient care. But the only things which may need inpatient care are people who may have severely scarred lungs because of a severe COVID pneumonia, which case they may be oxygen dependent for several weeks. Even minimal activity can precipitate, you know, severe breathlessness. So these people are the ones who probably need prolonged, maybe inpatient or some sort of a monitored care. But for all the others, you need to customize individually based on what symptoms they have. And I see a lot of psychological issues in these people. I think that is something which has been neglected. People are very, very worried, scared after recovery from COVID. As I told you, I had a patient who had severe panic attacks. That is more of a problem. The anxiety, fear, phobia complex. People who are initially anxious, then they develop fear, then they become uh, phobic. So... That, that's very difficult to manage because that affects not only them, it affects all the members in the family. You know, they start becoming a little irrational in their attitudes. Somebody asked, what is the most com common symptom of COVID-19? Somebody answered fear, cough and all that. No, somebody said it is fear. That's the most common symptom of COVID-19, whether it is pediatric or adult COVID. Am I right? You are not? absolutely right, sir. Every one of us had a fear during the pandemic. Every day when we get up, we have a fear whether we will be think part of the disease. most of us have crossed that. It's been one and a half, two years. We have learned to live with it. Wait till Delta minus comes in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have escaped for one and a half years, so I'll get to know next time. But I think we have to add all the vascular complication. We see every time the COVID comes down, there's an increase in number of MI strokes, peripheral vascular disease. Last wave also, because Chennai had a first peak in August, September, October, I think. Then we had an increased number in whole of October and November. This month, the MI stroke numbers are very high. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it is happening in all the hospitals. And majority of them are post-COVID. So MI strokes, peripheral vascular disease go up. 
somehow after the aspirin like now everybody with high risk in fact sometimes irrational so because we can't percolate to everybody we don't use a scoring system all the time anybody above 45 anybody with a diabetic any risk factors goes home with the aspirin or clopidogrel which probably has decreased the incidence of mi strokes quite a bit but it's not just covid these are people who genuinely have a high risk mm. who never actually followed up and with covid we figured out the sugars are very high you have a cardiovascular risk then started on aspirin probably that is helping them a bit and majority of post covid clinics not just picks up these anxiety problems they also picks up quite a bit of cardiovascular cardiovascular issues and vascular issues and a lot of them getting treated by that um, probably in the last two months we would have picked up some 2025 mi strokes or you know prevascular events a lot of them had revascularization that also goes in david diabetes madam diabetes see, last way we in fact charted so whenever patient used to go to the icu or high flow oxygen they were always having hbmc over 8 mm. this time it defied last time everybody with oxygen more than 6 or 8 liters had hbmc over 8 this time it wasn't that it and we had people without diabetes also so diabetes is a biggest risk factor for anybody going into icu we had patients who are in 90s with other problems without diabetes going home but you'll have patient is 35 28 with diabetics becoming very sick dying can't do anything diabetes seems to be the biggest risk factor for bad covid and invariably anybody coming in come with a very high hbmc the only people who come with low hbmc are patients who come with ckd obviously it's burnt out <laughs> all others come with a very high hbmc and they are the ones who become really sick too if one intervention which can save change a lot of things is probably control of sugars so what is your advice on anticoagulant uch and d dimer level see one problem is d dimer is a very labor intensive test even in the best of best centers the values are so aberrant so literally unless i have a suspicion i stop doing d dimer none of my residents do it automatically they have to get consent because what happens if they leave the sample outside it will become it goes in thousands and then the family panics they'll do it in another three labs one lab will be high one lab will be low and they'll be adjusting their uh, clexane or fragment along with that it's sheer nonsense so if somebody gets admitted and if i feel like for example we do see once in a while uh, we see in adults whenever we have a multi system whenever we have a doubt about coagulopathy then we follow serially otherwise we don't like at least in both the hospitals I work in, we don't monitor D dimer serially. At least my department, my people don't do it. So when we have a doubt, we monitor it. We may take it when we have a doubt about progression, and we don't decide based upon D dimer per se because you'll find D dimer value of 1,500 CRP of three. It doesn't make sense. It's supposed to come with inflammation. That means they have left the sample out for a longer period of time. Most of our labs were not; they were not trained to they are trained to test so much of D dimer values, and everybody was sending D dimers. So obviously all the values became aberrant. So for us, uh, using anticoagulants depends upon the patient. If the patient is ambulant, walking, if you are able to start physiotherapy when the patient is in the hospital, we just send them on aspirin. If the patient requires prolonged bed rest, if the patient requires oxygen, that's when we send them on anticoagulants, be it oral or parental. The moment they start walking, walking around, we go down to aspirin. Invariably, yes, the most misused drug in the hospitals I work is aspirin, but I think it has reaped dividends. MI stroke yeah, rates, I think, less. The, there was a recent study available saying that aspirin doesn't make a difference, but whether it has any long term benefits, I think that we have to like, don't actually, know. This know, is during the acute like, phase. Like, correct means we should probably use the Framingham Health Score and put it. But then, practically, I tried it initially, but then as the residents change, it is not becoming practical. So initially we used to put a scoring system, tick it and start aspirin. But then when the epidemic became huge, it is not practical. So everybody above 45, anybody with any risk factor, aspirin got started. Yes, you just have some bleeding risk once in a while we do get to see. But anticoagulation usage, I think wave two, everybody started going down on it, right? Down, but All I, the D-dimer test is probably one of the most abused of tests during the last uh, one year. Thanks, I, and one more person supports Absolutely. me. Absolutely. We know that there is no role for D-dimer. D-dimer is an acute phase reactant which goes up during initial phase. So if the CRP is high, generally the D-dimer is high. But we don't monitor or you know make our decisions on coagulating a patient based, based on the D-dimer at all. The only role for a D-dimer is it has a good negative predictive value. So if a person who is having COVID suddenly deteriorates and you think pulmonary embolism is a possibility, you do a D-dimer and the D-dimer is negative, then the chances of pulmonary embolism is unlikely. 
Apart from that, I don't think we we never used to do DMR also in our hospitals. We gave it up because it was it was all over the place and it made absolutely no sense in following it up at all. About ferritin and interleukin six. Same thing. We we realized along after the first wave, we realized all of these biomarkers were useful to prognosticate to a certain extent. To a certain extent. But there was no role period serially. The only the biomarker which probably has some value is CRP. I would like your opinion. CRP, we found that if people were even those who were stable, but they had a progressively increasing CRP going over 100, that made me a little uncomfortable because these patients had a possibility of going down. Other than that, we never used to do other markers serially or any other way. Earlier, we used to depend on IL-6 levels for starting tocilizumab. Because we have seen uh, D-dimer, ferritin, IL-6 being done even one, every day or twice in a day. Yes. So, so, the message what we learn from the experts, Krishna, here, frequently repeating a test, it's not only a factor on the economy and cost, it also misleads the treating doctor. See, what actually happens when the numbers become huge, if you open a huge quarantine center with 50 patients, 60 patients, with one doctor, for the hospital, it makes sense for them to do the test and decide who's sick. That's the reason they're doing it. If you take a places where a good clinician sees a patient decide, this will not happen. But when the numbers increase, majority of centers, including government centers, started doing CRP levels. You have to repeat it serially. It doesn't make sense. As he said, if you have a doubt, then fine. Why do you have to do it on every patient on every alternate day? It really doesn't make sense. So, but no, uh, like, you know, you do a test and, you know, we, we spend money on that. We don't, okay, we don't mind. But if it is going to mislead you and uh, subject you to treat the patient with unnecessary drugs, which is not required, take for instance, CT scan. I don't think in any part of the world, CT scan was used so much as it is being used in India. Every person after RT-PCR positive, they are seen in a, some CT scan chamber. And absolutely, you know, it exposes the people to radiation and unnecessarily some scores were given to a people who are clinically normal and they, that increases the fear phobia. Perfectly said. And not only the first CT, because again, as I said, one of their relatives had deteriorated after th three days. Every three days, I have seen people, three or four CTs in a matter of two weeks. Well, I thought we were doing it more because we used to have some CTs done when the patient deteriorates. Because one problem which was happening when they were staying with us for six weeks and all, the patient's family started demanding. So normally, there will be one CT1. After that, it used to be only X-ray. So second wave, we actually changed the policy and started doing CT when the patient was there for more than two weeks, four weeks when they started questioning us. We knew, but we didn't have a choice at all because it was so difficult explaining the mortality to them. Pneumothorax was becoming higher. and though, But as you said, CT has a very good predictive value for certain things. But yes, it is some. I have seen patients coming in only with CT and no RT-PCR because they believe that CT will diagnose and they don't want to do an RT-PCR because government will catch them. And you won't believe it, they'll come with a score of 18 or 20 out of 25, serial CTs 2, 3 taken with score of 2, 10, 20 and not a single RT-PCR coming in sick on a ventilator. Again, yeah, it's used more of it, more, more or less to get away from the disease. They believe that they don't have it, they don't want to do it. But this pneumothorax you are mentioning, uh, we see that more uh, like you know in ICU patients, is it because of the disease or some central line induced or whatever? Disease, disease. Like this time we saw, we saw patients having pneumothorax quite a bit because see uh, when the numbers are huge, I use two things extensively, ABG and pneumothorax and ABG and X-ray chest. Frankly speaking, sometimes more than it is required because I don't believe in daily ABGs. It's more of a clinical picture. But then when the numbers are huge. When, when you're not sure what's happening to the patient, patient is dull, you're not sure the oxygen saturation being monitored likely, getting an ABG or when the patient appears sick, getting an X-ray probably benefits, you know, rather than picking up the patient once the patient becomes sick. So we use these two, frankly speaking, much more extensively than we have ever used in our entire life. Just for minor aspects because when the numbers are huge. But then, as you said, uh, pneumothorax this time, the second wave, I think it's surely because of the numbers and the severity, we saw much more. We saw people having recurrent pneumothoraxes. I have one patient now who is on fourth or fifth ICD. Mm -hmm. They could do anything. And these are people, when they develop pneumothorax, the mortality is extremely high in the ICU. Pneumothorax is high in your hospital also, I guess. It is definitely more than before. And because of the severity of the illness, the fibrosis can lead to 
you know, popping off of the bullet and causing it. And second, people were ventilated because of the barotrauma also. The number of cases which were subject to high pressure oxygen and ventilation was and ventilation with pressure was much higher. So that also increased the risk of pneumothorax. So on the ventilator, if somebody deteriorated suddenly, it was either a pulmonary embolism or a pneumothorax usually. So these were the first two things we looked at. And we have also seen patients staying long in the hospital because the RT-PCR is repeated and still it is positive, hospitals are not discharging. Those scenarios also we saw, sir. I, I, I don't even want to go there because <laughs> this was so crazy. We know that for milder cases who don't require hospitalization, the virus cannot be cultured beyond eight days. So in people whose fever settles and they, they are fine, 10 days is the outer limit of isolation. 14 days if the fever lasts a little longer. And in people who are sick on the ventilator, 20 days is the period of isolation which has been determined and I think that is based on scientific evidence. But not just the, I, I again don't blame the medical community, it is people outside, you know, without a repeat PCR, don't come back to work. Without a repeat PCR, you know, you cannot go and, you know, act normally or work in an office. That puts, so the general perception was that you can continue to be infectious even after recovering two weeks later also you are infectious. So that was... Chennai Corporation was asking us to do PCRs after two weeks because they want to declare a patient to be non-infective and the patient is dead. So anybody in the ICU, I don't know whether the pressure is on Apollo, but here we don't have a choice. They're doing it after two weeks. I repeat PCR after two weeks. I don't understand the logistics. ICMR is given a clear guideline saying that no need to repeat the PCR. So for us the same guideline. After 20 days from the ICU or what say 14 days patient knows, patient is moved to non-COVID area. But then that doesn't matter to them. On the 14th day, PCR has to be negative. Okay, only then a patient will be declared non-COVID. But still the sensitivity of PCR is around 70% or is it, uh, do you see that any... See, uh, the sensitivity depends upon when you take a test. So in a peak of the epidemic, sensitivity will be much higher. Early into the epidemic, sensitivity will be appearing lower. Because sensitivity depends upon a lot of factors, including how they take the swab and uh, how long it's inoculated. A lot of things are taking lot of things come into the picture. So when epidemic is at the peak, everybody is working on that. Mm -hmm. They're doing it repeatedly. The sampling technique will be better. Mm -hmm. The way the test is done will be better. So in a peak of the epidemic, sensitivity will probably be higher. When you are at the lower trough, as the day is going, sensitivity will be slightly lower. So it is a very relative thing. But I would say majority will be 80-85% sensitive at this point of time. The rapid antigen test. Um See, one thing is Tamil Nadu never went the rapid antigen way. Just look into the states which went the rapid antigen way. The second wave started very early and the peak went up. The mortality was much higher because one simple thing, that is one mistake Kerala probably made in between when the numbers started fluctuating. Because rapid antigen tests, we know there are false positives and false negatives. So if the rapid antigen test is negative, you are giving a chance for the corporation people. They are assuming these people are non-infection. They are running around in the community, spreading it to others. A negative rapid antigen with the symptoms, they have to go for a PCR. But how will you ensure it? It is practically impossible in a huge place with a big epidemic. So I would still say that not doing rapid antigen tests has helped India, helped Chennai, Tamil Nadu per se. But I don't know. Once the industry is open, schools open, because UK, they are the, using this rapid antigen rampantly in school children. Mm. And then if they are symptomatic, they are going for RT-PCR. Till now, what I get to understand is the rapid antigen kit's positive and negative predictive value is not great. You need to have a test which at least has 80% predictive value. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult. Sir, this Rajon COVID-2, the Casavirimab, Indivirimab, is it going to be a game changer in the COVID-19 or is there going to be a scope for misuse? See, one of the deficiencies we had during the first and also the second wave was managing people who had milder infection, catching them early so that they didn't deteriorate because most of the treatments which are available are all in people who are hypoxic. So the once they go into hypoxia, we find in spite of steroids, in spite of other immunomodulators, some people just continue to deteriorate. We don't know why. So we have always looked at favorable outpatient interventions. We tried colchicine, we tried inhaled budesonide. Uh, tried ivermectin in some cases, but none of them, you know, there was a definite proof. So it makes, intuitively it makes sense if you say that the antibodies develop 
after five to seven days. So you give remdesivir earlier, but remdesivir is expensive. Remdesivir needs hospitalization. So not everybody can have remdesivir to decrease the virus load and maybe decrease the complications. These are all, you know, hypothetical. So this question of convalescent plasma came up. But extensive studies in convalescent plasma showed that if at all it has to show benefit, you have to use it within the first three days. And in the first three days, getting somebody in and admitting him and monitoring and giving convalescent plasma for which you need to have a, you know, big rigmarole of collecting may not be practical. So that is how this monoclonal antibody cocktail came in. And this is based on very sound scientific principles. You know, the early part, you prevent viral replication and attachment to the receptors by tackling, uh, you know, antibodies to the spike antigen. You get rid of the virus early. Studies have shown benefit, you know, it has definitely minimized hospitalization in people who have a high risk of progression. But then can it be used for everybody? Is it expensive. worth? Very expensive. The one kit, that kit costs about 1.2 lakhs, even though half the dose is what is recommended, that itself costs about 60,000. So it is limited to high risk people, but if they have money, I, I had a patient who was 25, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. He said, I want the cocktail. He said, you are in no way, you are not eligible to take it. No, I am worried about it. Is there any issue? Is there a contraindication? There is no contraindication. So I need it. So all these will start coming up. You know, do we need to keep it reserved for people who may actually need it if there is an increase in cases? We don't know. Now we are using cocktails also in people who are zero negative, who may not have antibodies present, but they deteriorate and they require oxygen. The recovery study has shown that is one another attractive uh, aspect. Zero negative means like... Uh Antibodies Antibody are not formed. Negative. So you get admitted to the hospital, you are hypoxic, you require 2 liters, I do your blood test, no antibodies found. You were very high dose, that's 3.2 lakhs. 4 grams, yeah. Four. Three, yeah. See, but for me it is a very elite way of giving convalescent plasma, frankly. Absolutely. So it's an elite oh. convalescent plasma. Convalescent plasma never had a proper trial. These people had the money to do a proper trial and they did it early, <laughs> showed benefits. So elite convalescent plasma, that's it. The benefits that have been described with regard to the um, uh, monoclonal antibody cocktail is very similar to the benefits of oseltamivir in, H in influenza, H1N1. Yeah. H1N1, no, we, we, gave, we wasted a lot of money on oseltamivir. People are going and fighting for oseltamivir and it reduced fever by a duration of 12 hours. WHO has now removed oseltamivir, the same thing is the status of monoclonal antibody today, but scientists are not keeping quiet. They are trying to find a very specific, instead of a cocktail, and they are targeting this Delta and Delta Plus right now. We may get a good monoclonal antibody, which might work if given on day one of illness. That that will be brilliant idea. But, but even this, not the good. results are dramatic. The point is when you give it to high risk groups, especially like for me, who comes on day one? Or I don't want to give it after three or four days or somebody with a pneumonia. I really haven't given it to anybody on oxygen. I really don't have the trust still. But when they come in early into the illness, very high risk group, especially patients transplant recipients, patients I know, obese lady with multiple comorbidities with capacity of only 100 meters or so, that kind of a patient we do give it. Because you know, even remdesivir 5 doses cost somewhere like 37 or 40 thousand. This is going to be only 60 thousand. It's not a very difficult thing. You don't admit them. You give it, next year you discharge them. So cost benefit wise, it's not bad. But then I feel it is not something which is generalizable. Is it going to be a game changer? I don't think so. For a select group of patients, definitely it's beneficial. But this is not a cost effective benefit for cost effective idea for the entire nation. It cannot be a game changer for the elite group, especially the sicker ones, high risk ones. Definitely there's a difference. My numbers are very small. I am sure I all our numbers put together will be very small. So we really can't say, but major nobody progressed. For example, like you said, I have had at least two patients with lymphoma treated, recovered, given rituximab. Antibodies in spite of two doses is still zero. And these patients are having ongoing COVID for, they, they get a little better, they worsen, they get a little better, worsen going on for one month. Persistently RT-PCR positive, persistently serology negative. In these kind of patients, yes, there is a role. It is worth investing and it does make a difference. Again, I will add probably in the early phase. Even in them, I would not give it later. No, we will know the answer next year. I'm yeah, sure I know, we'll, I know. I'm sure we'll have, it may Hopefully. go the Oseltamir way or may be a brilliant option where we uh, in such a, a dream situation we'll be giving to everybody on day one and cure complete cure 
eradication. Yes. It is said happen. to it is said to decrease the risk of hospitalization or risk uh, decrease the risk of hospitalization by seventy percent. It sounds very attractive, but when you look at the numbers, people who did not take remdesivir, the chance of hospitalization was three point two percent. People who took remdesivir, uh, sorry, uh, monoclonal antibodies, it dropped to two point two percent. So from three point four or something, it dropped to two point two well, point one, which actually is you know I, maybe I'm a little uh, not perfect precise, but that's a seventy percent drop. So that that's how it is. <laughs> so that's why you need to select your people who have a higher risk of hospitalization properly. So at least here it's, it's only a cost. You see that there is no observed contraindication on these drugs. But convalescent plasma, without checking a neutralizing antibody and giving it to patient, will it impose a risk of transmitting HIV hepatitis? Any plasma transmission transfusion is associated with risk. That is why this is a laboratory manufactured monoclonal antibodies which serves, uh, circumvents all those. So that's why you pay for it. But Heavily. even convalescent plasma also, like you know, hospitalization, everything put together, they'll come to that cost. Say so as long as this is maintained as a daycare, come in the morning, take it and go, it is a cost effective option. The moment they make it necessary to stay, things it will become more costly. So coming to our conventional remdesivir itself, sir, is it a wonder drug or is it being hyped? And we have seen hospitals even giving remdesivir up to 10 days and 12 days, saying the severity of disease is very high. So, what is your opinion on this use of remdesivir and the misuse that happens? Remdesivir is also time ever's brother. The sense it comes with a high lot of hype because if you look at the, the scientific evidence on how it acts, where it works and the way the virus replicates and how it causes, it makes very sound sense to give it within seven days when the virus is replicating and it's an antiviral agent. But studies have shown again, it all it does is reduce the duration of symptoms from 14 to 11 days. That's all it does. Again, like convalescent plasma and monoclonal, a subset of patients who got a fast progression, pneumonia within a week with high fever, they respond dramatically. But I would say it's not a drug you give it to. There are, there are two groups. One group who slowly progress over, like la first wave, it was all patients becoming hypoxic after two weeks, 10 days, 12 days, 14 days, sometimes even 18 days. This time we did see a significant proportion becoming sick by fourth, seventh day. That group probably have a benefit. If we do a subgroup analysis in this group, they may be a benefit. But usually, you know, it's it keeps on changing. Like, uh, I probably saw more of that group this time, especially in the younger age group. And some of them probably had a benefit with remdesivir, which may, if we have a larger group for analysis, may develop into a significant difference. But it is not a drug which can be, see, there is no drug which can be given uniformly across to everybody. That is the problem. There is no magic pill. There is no single drug which kind of fits, no? It is like too many drugs are there, you have to if fit and choose. there will be no for you, madam. <laughs> But it's easy to handle an epidemic. Uh, I think, actually, I think the in, a, in a lighter vein, in, uh, on, in several places in India, there were bigger queues for remdesivir and for Tasmac shops than for vaccination. That's Irony, true. very sad. Sir, we talk about high risk groups in adults for COVID. In children, do you say there are any particular high risk group or can it affect everyone? Very, very interesting question. Uh, the high risk groups described in pediatric literature, they've all been defined based on what our adult ID physicians say. You know, most of our pediatric ID is based on what these experts tell us. We extrapolated to pediatrics, unfortunately. Nothing original initially comes up from pediatrics. That too in COVID-19, whatever that has come up is all from adult COVID. The high-risk conditions in pediatrics which have been defined right from China to US are somebody with immunodeficiency, somebody who's on immunosuppressive drugs like what she said, the patient who's on rituximab and uh, or monoclonal other uh, immunosuppressive steroid, long-term steroids, somebody who has any chronic systemic disease, it may be a child with cerebral palsy, child with cystic fibrosis, child who's got a chronic lung disease, cardiac disease, chronic renal disease, these are the diabetics. More important than this is obesity. I think that is a very, very uh, significant group in pediatrics. Not only 
It's a high risk factor for severe COVID-19, also for MISI. But we have also seen many severe cases of MISI occurring in obese adolescents. That's a high risk group. Uh, but uh, again, in our own institution, we did a study. We looked at the morbidity and mortality in high risk. It was not different from normal children. As, as I reiterate again, COVID has been very kind and polite to children. So, but literature says, yes, post-transplant immunosuppressive, children on immunosuppressive drugs, immunodeficiency, they do badly. And those are the patients we do consider giving remdesivir upfront early in the course of disease. But most of them do well, even with underlying conditions. Non-COVID uh, infectious disease also now is on the rise, sir. So, are we seeing other uh, infectious diseases now spiking in adult as well as in pediatric age group? Is there any spike in the non-COVID infectious diseases? In, in fact, we were just discussing before this. Maybe you can uh, start with uh, pediatrics. Um, and mask has done wonders for children. One, two, closure of schools, closure of malls, cinema theatres, they've all done a lot of good to children. But during the months of uh, October, November, December, January, pediatricians thrive on respiratory infections and we, respiratory syncytial viral infections, influenza, they've all come down drastically due to masking and uh, school closures. We have hardly seen many children with acute wheeze, severe asthma, viral pneumonia. They have all come down drastically. But in our own hospital, we have found that uh, TB has not come down in pediatrics. Our numbers are surprisingly same. But that's very difficult to uh, extrapolate it to COVID-19 because TB has got a long incubation period and you don't know at what point of time a child manifests the clinical disease, it may be many years after the primary infection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And surprisingly, we have seen the same number of cases of enteric fever. This may be because of the swiggy culture, I don't know. And we have seen, in spite of absence of tourism, we have seen the same number of cases of scrub typhus in and around Chennai. That's a bit of a surprise. The number of cases we have seen, in spite of reduction of our inpatient by nearly 40 to 50 percent, the number of scrub typhus, IgM positivity, clinical SHAs has been very similar to what it was in 2000. I don't know whether it is because people uh, keep all their uh, clothes infested with all these uh, bugs. We don't know what is the reason. Mm -hmm. But uh, diarrheal illness, yes, it has come down. And the fever in general has come down. The fear of fever other than COVID-19 has come down. And uh, children don't go out, don't play. They're only becoming more obese. We are seeing more of psychological problems. Non-infectious diseases are on the rise. Constipation, behavior problems, mobile addiction, sleep problems, that's on the rise. In adults, there is, I would say there is a slight difference. Yes, we are finding increasing uh, psychological disturbances and mental health issues. But if you look at infections, the community acquired infections have significantly come down, whether it is malaria, whether it is dengue, whether it is typhoid, we are definitely seeing much less than we used to before. But if you look at hospital acquired infections, you know there is something called the hospital acquired or nosocomial infections. Now, Because of COVID, because of the fear, the personal protective equipment, the lack of compliance to hand hygiene, wearing gloves rather than washing your hands, all that is definitely, and patients who are sick on the ventilator, prone position, all of it has definitely increased. If you look at all the hospitals graph of hospital acquired infection, central line related infection, ventilatory associated pneumonia, urinary tract, all of them have gone taken like this. And as soon as the pandemic comes down, they come down. We saw it in the first wave, we saw it in the second wave also. Last wave, we didn't have, like hospital acquired infection was very less. Mm -hmm. Last week, we hardly had. In fact, the last wave, the whole year, microbiology culture positivity rate was so low. It had never been that level. Because one thing is, yes, we not many were ventilator. A lot of them were a non-invasive ventilator. And then we were putting non-invasive ventilator in the wards also. 
So this way when the intubation rates became higher, ECMO rates became higher, infections increased. Somehow COVID seems to be very resistant to secondary bacterial infection. So in fact last time the antibiotic dosage around that time, I am talking about the peaks from somewhere about August to December went down by 60 percent. This time everything has become double. Well, could be related to probably very likely related to the invasive intubation this time. Second, as he said, community acquired infection have come down. Patients coming back with UTI and pneumonias from the community has increased. And this is not, I am talk, not talking about pneumococci and H influenza. They are also coming with gram negative pneumonias. This is patients treated for COVID with steroids, going home, coming back with another infection. UTI or pneumonia or bloodstream infection. Those numbers are high. Every week I get to see two, three patients like that. Either treated in our hospital mm -hmm. outside, coming back with secondary sepsis, that is probably secondary to the immunosuppressed state. But COVID per se seems to be relatively resistant to secondary infection compared to flu. Flu time, your infection rates are generally very high. Definitely. This time probably related to the central line and intubation and probably lack of nurses rather than saying that num nursing numbers. By the time second mm -hmm. wave started, all of us are tired, not just the doctors, nurses, housekeeping. And obviously everything plummeted down. Towards the peak, I think every hospital in the city, everybody was tired. That probably would have saved probably 20, 30 percent more if that had not happened. True, no? Definitely. Because it, by the time all of them are tired, a lot of them are sick, they are tired, working 12 hour shifts, seeing 100 patients a day, it is practically becoming difficult. You know, proning. Last wave, if we are intubated, we used to diligently prone them, take them off on 18 hours. If they require second proning, third proning, uh, separate, it used to be a clear cut picture. This way, we were not able to do that. Mm. The numbers were huge. Almost everybody will be intubated. You'll have four or five patients on ECMO continuously. And the numbers, nursing ratio, that matters a lot. But as a rule, when you will use antibiotics in COVID, is because we have seen antibiotics given as a cocktail. But no, is there like, any role uh, for any antibiotics? Like in our in COVID? Like wherever I'm working in, it's strict no for empirical antibiotic therapy. We used Procal quite a bit initially, but then we realized that somehow Procal never picked up. Probably something drew at our labs or something. So, after that, the usage for three days increased because we did lose some patients with sepsis. Because there was something about not using antibiotic, which was going up in a big way. We did lose one or two patients with sepsis. After that, it was start the antibiotic, wait for three days, four days, culture's negative, come down. So, that probably increased the usage of antibiotics this cycle because Yes, our, our, our reluctance to use Procal to, somehow Procal was not always going up. When Procal went up, we were 100% sure it's a sepsis. There were a subset of patients where Procal didn't go up and patients still had sepsis. And once you see a patient dying like that, you don't want to do that. So you rely on the cultures. Um, empirical antibiotic, definite no. If you give empirical antibiotic, there's a very high risk of secondary infection. And it will be an MDR bug, your ICU will have MDR bug. And Another problem is reluctance to de-escalate antibiotic. That again causes problem. But despite everything, this time MDR bugs were there in all the hospitals during the peak. We just couldn't do anything. Yeah, we, we never used antibiotics in the first wave or the second wave for outpatient use. So if somebody comes in and had a COVID test positive, no azithromycin, no doxycycline, no comoxiclab, nothing was given. That is very clear and we, we had an excellent compliance to that. Anybody who is admitted to a COVID ward, with proven COVID and symptoms, you know, uh, conforming to COVID, no antibiotics. So in other words, there was no antibiotics in outpatient, no antibiotics for COVID wards, even on oxygen. Only patients who were intubated, patients who had persistent fever when antibiotics were used, again, as she said, concerned that there could be a secondary infection, usually in the second week. So our use of antibiotics actually came down during this time because but the patients who stayed in, on the ventilator longer, more than a week, more than 10 days, they ended up with secondary infections and they had to receive, you know, antibiotics to cover multidrug organisms. But uh, honestly, you are all representing less than 10% of the professionally run hospital with systems agree. and process. Imagine what is the other side. There are a lot of relational use and that starts from the younger age. So what is your view, sir? From pediatric mm -hmm. age, there are a lot of pediatricians who start abusing antibiotics and the children are losing their immunity. Uh, what is your view on that? This is an international problem. See, even in US things are not uh, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, young pediatrician, child goes with fever and URI, 
he will look at the ear and diagnose arteritis media and prescribe courses of amoxiclav and uh, acetromide. It happens everywhere. Everywhere it is there and uh, India is no exception. And uh, what is happening in COVID is that there is enough data that the secondary infections in COVID has been far less when compared to other viral infections, surprisingly. Mm. But when compared to influenza, RSV, the incidence has been very low. But in spite of that, antibiotic abuse takes place, not only for COVID, but all. See, no, the, the moment the doctor uh, is seen by the parent with uh, fever, with any symptom, diarrhea, cold cough, invariably an antibiotic is uh, doled out. And in fact, uh, doctors, if, you, if, I, if I prescribe only paracetamol to somebody with fever, the parents won't be happy. They also feel that antibiotics has to have, have to be given. In fact, many a time I have seen parents coming to me, sir, I had a throat infection, I went to an ENT doctor, I went to a physician, he gave me acetromycin or ciprofloxacin, my child is also having cold. When I tell them nothing is required, paracetamol, and I also tell them, you also don't require antibiotic, I examine the throat, I stop the drug, I tell them, don't take. <laughs> so, I am not an adult physician. I, I take uh, the courage. If both of you are having cold, mother is also having cold. It cannot be anything but viral. Why should you, why should you, you all be taking antibiotics? Right? So, it's a, I mean, it requires conviction. The doctor, first of all, he should be convinced that what he is treating is going to get better in spite of him or his prescriptions. One. Two. The moment you prescribe an antibiotic and send, it takes lesser time. You can see 100 patients a day. The moment you say, like Ram Thuranam, no, at this point of time, all science, you try to counsel them. It's going to take 8 to 10 minutes or even 20 minutes. And he's going to ask you more questions. You run the risk of him defecting to the other doctor who prescribes antibiotic. Third is a lack of confidence. And even our medical schools don't teach antimicrobial stewardship, I'm afraid, as well as it should be taught. And you know, the pharma industry is also partly responsible. He will give you a 1962 reference saying that cefixim is very good for pneumonia. <laughs> okay, and you won't have time to go to go and verify whether the literature is correct or not. So well, there are several reasons for this malady and we need to fight it. And in fact, I can also tell you the Indian Academy of Pediatrics has been in the forefront of this. We have uh, created a lot of modules on antimicrobial stewardship and uh, uh, we conduct programs to sensitize pediatricians, but it's still a long way to go. And it's often said that, you know, there's one treatment in the auditorium. We, Ram Sorani will give a nice talk on appropriate antibiotic use and rational antibiotic therapy. Everybody will clap, wonderful lecture, they'll shake hands. When they go to the office, the protocol will be completely different. That gap has to be bridged like what is happening in the NHS or in UK. And we have to go a long way towards it incentivization for using antibiotics. Unless you disincentivize antibiotic usage, I don't think things will change. It's a great learning. Sir, one of the other things you see is still the diagnosis of typhoid being made with Vidal's. If you see the prescription, the, the, the paper we see is Vidal positive, enteric fever, admission, antibiotics. So, what is your take on Vidal's? In over two decades, I have not asked for a Vidal test even once. And the main, the, the answer to that is what Dr. Bal Subramaniam said that it is much easier when there is a parent, when there is an, even adults, they come with, you know, parents or whatever. They, they, what is the cause for the fever? Why am I getting fever? It is very simple for a doctor to do a Vidal and say, see, you've got typhoid. And you do a Vidal test, there is an 80% hit rate. You've and lepto. 100% ah, Lepto is 100% 100% Lepto mat, mat. Everything it will be positive. Uh -huh. So, you do a combination of these, you will definitely give an answer to the patient. You need not even talk but with the patient. Lepto is also positive? No, we are, we are endemic. endemic. We are all immune. No, no, no. That, that, is, that is not uh, sickness in the patient. It is serology sickness in the laboratory, <laughs> not in the patient. See, any? You know, they will oblige you with some positivity and you know there are several fever panel tests. 1,500 rupees, 6 diseases, 4,000 rupees, 8 diseases. Definitely, it is like, you know, taking an AK-47 and trying to shoot at everybody. At least one person will get killed. Others might survive. So, so one test will definitely be positive. positive. You have that an is serology sickness. Mm -hmm. In the laboratory, not in the patient. And it need not be treated. 
I think clinical medicine, uh, I'm sure Ram Suryam will say one day fever, two day fever. It's all clinical medicine. It's not laboratory medicine, right? I'm sure it's going to become worse and worse because with technology, we are going to have PCR, uh, multiplex PCR, which panels, which are going to give you false, I mean, positivity for several pathogens. And we are going to break our heads what to do. And most of the time, children in pediatric, most children will be all right, but the lab the reports will not be all right. And Parents they will go will from right. And we are getting mixed diagnosis, typhoid with leptospirosis, typhoid with malaria. You will get a UTI also thrown in because urine culture, culture will show 10,000 colony count of some <laughs> organism which is a contaminant. Urine routine will be very pristine. So, UTI plus this thing. So, that's why we had to give everything. Very, very difficult. So, the moment the doctor says, he gives a label, the, the patient is happy. Doctor, two days fever, what is the cost? Uh, if I say, I don't know, but I think it is viral. Are you sure? They ask you, <laughs> then you get into trouble. So, he asks for evidence. That's one. Second thing is, if you say you do not know, he thinks this fellow is no good. So, on the other hand, if you give a report and saying that it is there, he is convinced he is happy. And you know, most of the viral illnesses are going to get better, including COVID-19, in 80 to 90 percent of uh, normal individuals. So, you can always say, my medicine only cured it. And one of the diagnoses often misused is clinical malaria. Sir. We also see uh, empirical anti-malarials. So, what are the rationale behind all this? Chloroquine brings down fever. See, yeah. that's the rationale. <laughs> In spite of freedom from the British, we still talk about empire. <laughs> <laughs> See, these things, as I said, this is a culture which has to change. And the cultural change has to start in two situations. One, a medical curriculum, a student doing MBBS has to be taught these things so that this has to be continued all through. Two, educating the public. The public thinks, you know, how many cases during COVID, as Dr. Bala said, they come to you saying, no antibiotics. They'll come back the next day, I'm now bringing phlegm. Give me antibiotics. I said, phlegm doesn't mean, but this is a respiratory infection. You know, phlegm means I need antibiotics. That is the equation. If there is a sore throat, if there is a cough, if there is a phlegm, you need antibiotics. That is the public perception. That has to change. Change doesn't come overnight unless the whole system works on it, <clears throat> which is going to take time. But I think it's time we started at least 10 years down the road, we will not be sitting and talking the same thing. So, we need to have more regulations for antibiotics. You are regulating tuberculous medicines, probably we should start regulating for antibiotics too. Over the counter antibiotic usage, pharmacists giving antibiotics, antibiotics without a diagnosis. Once we stop that itself, a significant proportion of antibiotic use. Every antibiotic given, they need to be a justification. And once that becomes centralized, a lot of things will become simpler. The other area we see is, madam, in the e split transfusions for dingo. So, where you yes, see still not when there is a, even a trivial drop, the platelet is given. And not only platelet is given, we also even see single donor platelets. I know. In fact, there is no rule for platelet, platelet transfer in dengue at all. But even now, our NVDBD guidelines, that National Vector Control Board guidelines, still says platelet transfusion less than 20,000. And every time we end up arguing with the patient. Less than 20, 000, there is no, no. We don't give platelets at all unless it's less than 10,000 or a patient comes in with bleeding or because there is legally you can't. So that's the reason less than 10,000 we give. Otherwise, we don't because the disease per se platelet doesn't work. So sometimes, you know, if it's 10,000 all, we just buy time. Another 6 hours, 12 hours, patient becomes all right. We get away because platelets do not work in dengue. Mm -hmm. But even now, our own guideline says platelets. But this I is like ivermectin for COVID. But even single donor platelets, ferocious see, platelets, like, see, platelets is going even beyond. Certain times, for example, some high risk patients where there is an increase, increased bleeding risk, yes. But as a general, there is no role for platelets in dengue fever. Even if there is some bleeding that even is... Even if the patient comes in bleeding, you end up correcting that. But it's not platelets donation. Because when they come in with bleeding, then it's DIC. You treat as DIC. But it's not just platelets. Platelets are given empirically when the patient comes with low platelets, but that's it doesn't because the disease pathophysiology is different. There is capillary leak, there is marrow suppression, there is sequestration. So what happens? The patient goes in for DIC, for DIC, and they bleed. And they, what is the role of platelets in that? So WHO guideline clearly says no role for platelets, but Indian guideline still says platelets. 
and in fact giving platelets suppresses the marrow further it takes a longer time for the patient to come down so you'll have patients with 30 40000 platelets receiving platelets every day staying at the same 20000 30000 for 4 5 days then becoming all right can't do anything so the problem with platelets uh, uh, in dengue is that for the common man she knows only about the platelet numbers that's what he is scared of in fact in our own hospital my pg will be taken to task if he repeats platelet count on a stable child with dengue even if it is 10000 sir was mentioning 20000 20, child is not bleeding not in icu not undergoing any uh, invasive procedure no pulmonary hemorrhage no systemic hemorrhage we don't do anything in fact we don't even repeat the platelet count if we are sure we repeat only pax cell volume and monitor the child we don't do repeat platelet count at all but the parents even if i don't repeat they will ask sir have the has the platelet count come to normal i tell them there is no need your child is well most of the time the child will start scratching at the time of recovery i tell them you start dancing child is well you go home there no need to do that one two platelet transfusions can be highly risky in fact uh, we have seen trolley transfusion associated lung injury ards like picture after multiple platelet transfusions over 3 4 days and uh, in a country like ours where you know you have definitely a risk of transmission of viral viruses through platelet transfusion most importantly platelet half life is going the moment you give it will go off in another 4 hours from the body it's not going to work and they will repeat after 12 hours platelet count will still come down repeating there is no way you can do that there is enough data you don't have to treat the number of platelets it's mm. clinical judgment unless somebody has a serious visceral bleeding with a divc picture unless somebody is going to undergo say a central vein insertion or a thoracentesis for some therapeutic uh, intervention so surgery in dengue very rarely it happens you do not have to give platelet transfusion and platelets don't save lives mm. sir coming back to covid no? sir we have seen drugs being used other drugs like olinastatin sepsivac thymosin alpha glutathione ivih in other indication than what sir said jack 1 2 inhibitors then uh, favipiravir molnupiravir all those drugs we have seen are they really beneficial in covid sir the simple answer is no nothing further to say no he had the answer in his question itself at the stone but what are the damage to the patient who are taking it if there is no benefit but still if it is prescribed that is the reason why most drugs are used you know when i say no antibiotics the first question the doctor or the patient turns around and asks us is there any harm in using this and people perceive it's just like the question of vaccine you know what is a harm in covid what is a harm in vaccine people start questioning that when you know that the risk of covid is 100 times more than the risk of a vaccine similarly just because we don't know or it is not measurable what the damage this can do in the next 2 3 days people think they are safe very very wrong but the answer often we get is patient is sick hence we used that is not an excuse i can't think of a proper corollary here but you know just because there is lack of evidence doesn't mean there is evidence of lack it's like that you know this is a situation where we don't know what these and these problems may be delayed the the mucormycosis is a situation is it because one of these agents we are using we don't know so just because we don't know doesn't mean it is the right thing to do can tocilizumab increase the risk sir Yeah, second infection rates are pretty high. Tosilizumab But none of the studies have looked beyond four weeks on the effects of tocilizumab and mortality. We see patients know. coming till three Even months with lung abscess. Zinc can increase the risk of mucormycosis theoretically. Who oh, is it? Theoretically, yes. Yeah, yeah. Zinc, zinc is being given left rashes, and right, thinking injury. that it is going to help in COVID. It doesn't help, and it might increase the risk of mucormycosis. One of the hypotheses is that in in India, one of the reasons they postulate. could be zinc we don't know everybody the, is taking the zinc do, the, they say the dose required is very high and what we get in the tablets is very less i don't know this been something which is going we, on quite a bit in discussion we don't know we, we don't, don't, don't know so what is needed is what is called as clinical equipoise which means you should be grounded to 
act on evidence and if there is no evidence keep quiet just because you don't have anything to use with evidence doesn't mean you have to write 10 things that is what i think we need to correct deoxy d glucose sir the 2 dg drdo now this is the point of discussion what is the scope of this drug sir how do you view this drug again we don't know the studies excluded diabetics and several other you know uh, comorbidities which limits the use of this drugs to very very small population and we still don't have peer reviewed studied evidence to say that it works so i can't say it doesn't work but i need more evidence if i am going to start writing it i need more evidence so we should learn not to we should learn to have a simple prescription without anything and we should get patients to accept that once that acceptance comes everything will settle down because everybody wants four five drugs in the prescription one paracetamol or one one something like one rantac or one fragment alone is never enough that is a problem the panic now sir is about the third wave where children are again predicted to be affected so now with vaccines sir they are still have not been launched for children so what time you expect sir and what is the age group when uh, children can be vaccinated for a change uh, we pediatricians are not very aggressive in promoting covid-19 vaccine at the moment see if you look at the uh, disease so far you know it has been very mild in children except for the risk of missy there is hardly anything for a normal child and this disease is behaving differently in adults and uh, what is the best way to protect children from this disease is it vaccination or is there any other method yes it is vaccination but first we must complete the vaccination above 18 years of age before we start vaccinating children the reasons are many there is enough evidence that children are not super spreaders they have not been for a change in an infectious disease children are not being blamed for spreading infections to the community it is the other way children are getting it from adults and uh, now zero surveys have shown that 50% of our children are likely to be positive in fact we uh, we did a survey in our hospital from april to november last year that time itself we had shown it was around 20.9 i am sure if you do it it will be easily 50 to 60% second thing is children majority are going to recover they are not high risk like uh, diabetics or hypertensive there is a small risk of the vaccine in children there is a theoretical risk i mean it's not zero nobody knows it is postulated that if you give the vaccine the antibodies which they produce might initiate miss c the multi system inflammatory so mm. we don't know in fact the messenger rna vaccine in us in 12 to 18 years has caused quite a few cases of myocarditis mm. so there are some concern so right now our priority should be to vaccinate 70% of our population above 18 years then if there are good trials available regarding the safety by which time it will take another 6 months to 1 year i am sure there will be good data on the vaccine safety in children that is the time for a change pediatrician to start pushing for the vaccination most vaccines we are the first to push for it right but in this disease i think we can wait until adults are vaccinated completely so the focus should be to vaccinate 70% of the adult population above 18 years yeah in my clinic what i tell the parents of children i see i uh, you know they come for some other illness i ask the parents or the grandparents there have you all got vaccinated mm. and i tell them please get yourself vaccinated for the sake of your grandchild or child so that's a better tonic that incentivizes them actually you know when you say that you know you do it for the betterment of your grandkids do we need any booster dose after these two doses already studies are on you know the third dose after 6 months after the second dose seems to boost up your immune response it's not yet uh, recommended but we are heading the way as was mentioned before that it is going towards the flu way and probably every year we may need a modified boost 
based on the current circulating stream. But can there stream. be an interchangeability of the brands? Let us say I use one brand now. Yes. Can I have a booster with another brand or yes. a different type of vaccine? Already even the first course where the second dose, a different vaccine or a vaccine from a different platform is being used to stride for various reasons. Some of them are doing as part of a study in some countries in Europe because of non-availability. They are doing it. And so far, again, very limited evidence. It seems to be safe. Whether it is beneficial or whether it is going to be equipotent as the same uh, vaccine, we still don't. know. So, is there any benefit in doing an antibody test after vaccination or after uh, the discharge from an illness? No, because basically the point is the immunity which is required is not humoral immunity. So, this antibody test level or the peak may not indicate clearly your immune, immune level. So, you may not have a good antibody level and you can still resist the infection. It could be the other ways also. So, antibody test is more for a community zero survey to know how many people have had it. But does it really indicate your immune status? I doubt it. So, the spike protein, IgG antibody. As I said, the only relevance is if you are thinking of monoclonal antibodies in patients who are not doing well in hospital. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, I don't think there is any relevance uh, in individual clinical management at this point. Coming to breakthrough infections, sir. even after two doses of vaccine, we see breakthrough infections and sometimes even yeah, last week only I have vaccinated, this week I have been diagnosed with COVID. Patients tend to ask us, what is your take on breakthrough infection? We call it a breakthrough if they have finished two doses and two weeks have passed. If you get it before the two weeks or after the first dose, that is not counted as, you know, vaccine effectiveness at all. We always, we already know very clearly that the vaccines do not prevent reinfection or prevent infection. They only minimize the severity of infection, minimize hospitalization and minimize death. So, getting an infection is definitely possible even two weeks after the second dose of any vaccine. But we have very clearly seen that all vaccines, even if it is a variant, if you have taken two doses, it is definitely protective in minimizing the severity of the illness. So, your breakthrough infection is something that happens two weeks after taking the second dose? I don't know whether you call it breakthrough. What I mean is, you can get an infection even after vaccination. And that is considered as, you know, uh, an infection occurring after vaccination is if it is two weeks after the second dose. Does breakthrough infection mean that my vaccine is not working in a common man language? Sir, huh. one thing, basically we must all remember no vaccine is 100% effective and efficacious. I don't, there is no vaccine at all. That's one. Two, you look at the history of vaccination for COVID-19 so far, few facts have emerged. Any vaccine, any of the available vaccines, all of them do a few good things. One, they reduce definitely the risk of death. They reduce the risk of hospitalization. I'm sure Rams would agree. They reduce the risk of a need for oxygen. Most importantly, they reduce the risk of infection. It may not be 100%. It may be 90% with messenger RNA. It may be 50% with the Chinese vaccine. It may be 70% with the uh, uh, COVID shield and 70 to 80% with Covaxin. Definitely vaccines are effective, but vaccines are not 100% effective. And we do not know how long the vaccine immunity is going to last. And we do not have the correct surrogate marker of immunity following vaccination. For example, each vaccine has got a different platform. One is messenger RNA, and another is spike protein. Which one, if you measure, is going to tell you this person is fully protected or not? We do not know. And we do not know much about to, as of today, there is enough evidence that the antibodies or the immunity after vaccination lasts for at least 11 months. That's all data is available. We will know more only next year. That is a time when we talk about uh, the vaccine failure and the breakthrough mm. infection. Spoke in detail about standardization of treatment. But another area is standardization of costs. For a similar type of treatment, we get bills ranging from 2 lakhs to 10 lakhs. We have even got bills up to 58 lakhs. So, and this treatment cost varies between hospitals, between metros, between uh, other areas. So, what is your take on this? Sir? The government for now has capped RT-PCR and remdesivir. 
the other components are still not capped. In a situation where there is a phenomenal disparity between the, the poorest or the hospital with least, uh, shall I say, care or you know infrastructure and the best hospital in India being the difference between Everest and probably Chennai, and again, you're asking the wrong person. I'm a poor practicing physician, you know, I, I get only the consultation fees. So this kind of situation, we cannot answer. I have I worked in the US, I worked in the UK. There, I think you can say very confidently, the disparity between the poorly performing hospital and the best performing hospital will probably not be very much. Whereas in India, for various reasons, there is a huge difference, whether it is the infrastructure whether it's the, the ethical issues, I don't think you can bridge all of this to ensure that this is minimized. I don't have an answer. Standardization of cost is all what we are looking forward to. Very difficult. Unless all the insurance companies join together and come out and insist that the medical care be standardized with regard to both the cost and with regard to the, uh, you know, the template as I said before. See, when you can get a, a Rolex watch for several lakhs and you can get a Titan <coughs> watch or some other watch or even a, another simple watch for something which is 100 rupees, you cannot uh, expect the same kind of thing is what, what is happening with medical care. So, it's a very, very tough thing to handle but someday at some point of time, uh, there should be some standardization happening because it's not only for the insured patients, even they are only for less than 15 percent in India. Any effort taken towards sanitization will help even the uninsured segment in a very big way. And uh, that apart from the cost, it enhances the trust and confidence on doctors. Today, like you know, advancements are growing in medicine, but the paradox is trust and confidence is declining. That's true. So the deficit is increasing, trust deficit is increasing and we have to do something about it. So we are starting somewhere. The information that the experts here were shared with us. Our, uh, we uh, and uh, our Star Health Insurance are really grateful for your time because you people are real serious of th thousands of patients and you are sharing your ground experience, your uh, practical experience, which is more difficult to find in textbooks or in uh, websites. So we are very grateful to you and very, very thankful to you. Definitely you have added a lot of clarity. My physician and along with uh, us, a lot of doctors here, we are going to transcend this information to thousands and thousands of people whom we come across. And as we uh, were discussing, like, you know, there is a lot of thing where we have to promote awareness among the public and, and among the doctors. And definitely this interaction is going to help prove this cause. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.